problem with the perpetual virginity is not just those eight scriptural points that I brought out, the fact that he is the firstborn, not the only born, the fact that he, she knew her not till this had happened, that, that Christians ought not to defraud one another except for a short amount, short amount of time and so forth. The, those aren't the primary problems here. The primary problem is that it, what's being accepted is this widespread view, and not every time that someone says that the Virgin Mary are they affirming perpetual virginity, which seems to be a flaw in the rebuttal, but that there's this widespread view that starts from calling her a Virgin Mary because she was a virgin when Jesus was born. It was a miraculous conception. And expanding that into perpetual virginity in view of this view that it's a very high end to be perpetually virgin and that it's somehow sinful or corrupt for, for married couples like Joseph and Mary to have sexual relationships. That colored and stained the view. And what's very strange here is that Mr. Albrecht seems, that, seems to think that it's not fair for the Reformed Church to have any kind of doctrinal development. For example, as he pointed out, Turton doesn't say that he that he insists that it's true that she was a perpetual virgin. He just says it's a pious belief and that he thinks it's probable that she was. But it seems as though the when we look at it more carefully, we consider it more fully, and we look at a detailed analysis of the language, such as that performed by Dr. Eric Svensson, we see that there is, in fact, strong reasons not to accept Rome's claim of perpetual virginity. And it's not just Rome's claim. There are many other Christians uh, over the years who have held it, from Augustine to uh, to Turton, who all these men who, who did hold to the idea, at least at some level, not, not as a doctrine of an article of faith, but rather as a view that it's the most likely or it's the proper thing. And we're not, we're not condemning them to hell because we disagree, but we're just saying we have a better understanding now. We have a more complete and full understanding. And it's very strange then for, for that to be unfair, to that to be out of bounds, but for us to see folks like Ludwig Ott, Ludwig Ott throwing the fathers under the bus when it comes to the topic of in part two virginity from the physical integrity standpoint. And Mr. Albrecht himself is – uh, willing to go along with the fathers, which would put him you know, on the opposite side of the table from Ott, but would uh, not be able to do so on a principled basis. In other words, it's not that we must do it because, well, that's what mo the fathers pretty much said. Instead, we have a sort of an unprincipled, well, I haven't really thought about it. I haven't really dealt with it. And the fact that they've essentially unanimously, all the ones that argue for the perpetual virginity also uh, hold to a view of of a miraculous birth, uh, which again comes from you know heretical documents like this uh, this proto evangelium of James, and you know it's fine to say we don't listen to heretics and to call Tertullian a heretic. Jerome tried calling him a heretic too. It's not a new argument, but uh, you know. It's fine to say we don't accept what heretics say, we accept what the fathers say, but it's not done consistently. The, what, we're, not ask, we're asking the Roman church to accept what Augustine had to say about making matters of faith only those things which are clearly taught in Scripture and not to demand faith from us in things which are dubious. Those are the teachings of the fathers as well. And in those teachings of the fathers, if we don't pick and choose what the fathers have to say, would wind us up viewing this doctrine, even if it's widely held among the fathers, not as a matter of faith, but as something that which may be held or may not be held according to as it, how much it persuades the person who's listening. And using that standard, if we simply use the standard of whether one can be persuaded from Scripture, I think that we've seen the weight of the scriptural evidence today in the eight arguments that I've presented uh, have been unrebutted, have been unchallenged, and uh, carry the day and from a scriptural standpoint. So thanks to, again to Mr. Albrecht and Mr. Chaplin, and uh, with that, thanks, thank you for listening. Okay, thank you for that, Turd and fan. Mr. Albrecht, you now have four minutes for your closing. You may begin when you're ready. In conclusion, we find that today's debate shows us a number of things. It shows us a Turretin, Turretin fan, along with modern-day Protestantism, surely has no answer for the unanimous teaching of the faith in that Mary remained a perpetual virgin. No instance in Scripture can be brought forth that shows that Mary ever lost her virginity, or that the brothers and sisters of Christ were children of Mary. The earliest patristic evidence that denies the perpetual virginity of Mary is indeed Tertullian. Some might wonder why there was no outcry due to Tertullian's comments on Mary. 
Jerome solves this problem by simply pointing out that Tertullian was not part of the church. Indeed, there are numerous other comments that are simply unorthodox in many of Tertullian's comments. Tertullian, in the very same section of his denial of Mary's virginity after the birth of Christ, himself says that Christ, our Lord and Savior, was ugly. Certainly, Tertullian, who was not reckoned among the early fathers of the church, was out on the limb here. But what is most interesting is that in Tertullian, who, who is the earliest evidence of the denial of Mary's perpetual virginity, he never ever uses the verse of Matthew one twenty five ever, yet he numerous times speaks about Mary having lost her virginity. In fact, we don't find Matthew one twenty five interpreted as meaning that Mary later on had sexual relations with Joseph until the late 4th century by an Arian heretic by the name of Helvidius. It is interesting that the earliest evidence for the denial of the perpetual virginity of Mary can be found among Montanist and Arian sources. Church, in fact, claims that I never touched upon his arguments, but indeed anyone that hears this debate We'll see how I diffuse those arguments in the very beginning of the debate in my opening speech, and church and fans still put forth the arguments I had answered previously. What about the argument that Protestants bring forth? What about the argument of monogamous? If Christ was the only born to Mary, wouldn't this term have been used? As we examine clear, monogamous doesn't always mean only. Wisdom 722 of the Septuagint shows us this very fact. What about the other argument of Heos Hu? Well, if Heos Hu were such a landmark argument against the perpetual virginity of Mary, we would surely find it employed by the early opponents of the perpetual virginity. But indeed, we only find the passage used in the late 4th century. What's even more glaring is the fact that Codex Vaticanus lacks Sahu after Heos in its manuscript. And indeed, Matthew 14, 22, 26, 36, 2 Peter 1, 19, and Revelation 6, 11, among others, and contemporary writers all disprove Eric Svensson's shoddy work on this topic. Indeed, I'll take the church fathers, who lived in the early age of the church, over a theological novelty. What about, what about Prototokos? We've seen how the term is not always used to refer to a child that is followed by their children. We've also examined the argument of the usage of brothers and sisters, Adelphos and Adelphi, to be quite weak, since Adelphos is not always used in speaking of a brother only. We find proof of this in the Septuagint and the New Testament alike. We also heard about the argument of Joseph and Mary coming together. And Church and Fan uh, definitely points out the, 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 the usage of, uh, of the term sunerkomai, which has a sexual usage in, uh, in Corinthians. But what he conveniently fails to mention is that this term comes out over 30 times in the New Testament. And out of all the appearances in Corinthians, it's the only place that it appears in a sexual manner. But what about the, uh, the, uh, the, the argument of, uh, of the, the apocryphal uh, work, uh, Proto-Evangelium, being uh, a raving? Well, then, uh, as we realize, there can be nuggets of truth even within an apocryphal work. For instance, there are no doubts that the pieces of apocryphal works and pagan works quoted by the New Testament authors are indeed not inspired. Yet as seen within the New Testament itself, they contain truths. The same can be said within this work as well. Turton also says that the miraculous birth comes from Gnostic sources. This only shows his unfamiliarity with the biblical language. The Hebrew term yalad each time is used in reference to one that will give birth due to something miraculous. So the miraculous is scriptural and definitely doesn't have its sources in Gnosticism. As we can see, there is not biblical evidence or historical evidence that supports Mary ever lost her virginity. Mary is I et Parthenos, as the early church affirms. Okay, that now concludes our debate today. The debate, again, was entitled The Perpetual Virginity Debate. Our two debaters, again, were Mr. William Albrecht and Turd and Fam. Uh, contact information for Mr. Albrecht, again, is catholiclegate.blogspot.com and youtube.com backslash GNRhead. And Turd and Fan's contact information, once again, is turdandfan.blogspot.com. Um, youtube.com backslash turd and fan and he's also a contributor to aomn.org where you can go read some of his posts um, thanks everyone again for being with us and uh, we hope to see you again in the future